Hey everybody, it's Ben here, and today I'm at the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. Unfortunately, due to COVID, they did not have the energy fair last year, and this year they're only just having a much smaller one-day members event. But as part of it, uh, they're showcasing their new energy storage lab. So I'm going to head inside and see if I can tag along on one of the tours showing off the new battery technologies and how they work with solar. Anyways, my name is Nick Mathis. I work for the MREA here. I've been a full-time employee for the last two and a half years, and I was a part-time instructor for about the 10 years previous to that. My background's electrical. I've been working as an electrician um, for the last 20-ish years. I've been working, focusing on solar for, I think, about 13, 14 years, something like that. Uh, all the equipment we've gotten is donated, and so if you see something not represented, that's not because we don't like them, it's just because they haven't donated yet. They haven't um, acquiesced to my pleas or my per persuasive emails. Um, oh yeah, so we have the, got a good um, spec spectrum of the available technologies here. And as we'll go through, we'll look at each different unit and we can talk about the differences and the similarities between them. But um, the one common theme you'll see, you'll hear throughout this is that they're all so different. There's so many variables that can affect how the system operates, how it's integrated, that there's never just a one size fits all solution. People ask me, what's the best battery system? I say, well, what, is your, what, what do you want to get out of it? What's your use case? What's your limitations and expectations? And so each of the systems can be, will be a little bit uh, different there. So if everybody wants to, uh, if people want to filter in or stand by the um, doorway, that's just great. What we have here is a few of our different systems. And you'll see we've got our Panasonic Evervolt system. So it's a Panasonic system, uh, but it's just branded as Evervolt. And so here we've got our inverter in our battery container so you can see we've got our lithium ion battery modules in here these are individual units there's actually two deep stacked in here so we got one two three four room for another two more five six and so we've got our energy storage our batteries here and that's DC, direct current. You think of like a flashlight battery, something like that, same, same difference. We plug into our wall outlet, that's gonna be alternating current, 120 volts. So that's alternating. If you remember the old Tesla Edison battle, the war of the currents, there was alternating current versus direct current. Um, so things have changed a little bit since then, but we still have the principles of difference between AC and DC. So we've got our solar panels on the roof. Everybody notice, if, if, if everybody's able to notice, we filled up every usable sur roof surface out there to get as much energy into our different battery systems as we can. And so, uh, so coming from the roof, from the solar panel, that's going to be direct current. And it comes into our inverter, and here we've got our direct current battery bank. So we're able to get that direct current into our batteries. That's good. Uh, to get out to the utility grid, we're going to need to have that alternating current, that grid quality waveform, right? And so that's what this thing's one of this thing's jobs is, to create alternating current out of direct current so that we can utilize, send it back to utility grid, we can utilize it to start the coffee maker, the toaster, all the important stuff, the beer fridge, right? And so, um, so we need an inverter to do that. And there's essentially three different types of inverters that we can use in solar electric systems. We've got our multi-mode inverter, which can charge batteries. It can act as a battery charger, but it can also operate as utility inner tide. It can send back power to the utility grid. So it's got a lot of functionality there. Um, another style of inverter would just be a straight off-grid inverter, just straight battery based. All it does is it works with the battery system. It can't communicate with the utility grid. It would blow up if you tried. Not really, well, some may. And then the other option there is to have a grid interactive inverter. So that's all it's made to do is you communicate or send power to the utility and um, have the power balance there, send and take from the utility. Um, but that utility grid inverter cannot operate with batteries. 
Okay, so we got the three different styles, and what you'll see in each one of these, because we have batteries, they're all multi-mode inverters. And so key similarities and differences with our technologies here. Um, so we have, okay, I'll keep going here, I guess. So we've got our Panasonic white, that's our AC coupled Evervolt system. Here, this black one is the DC coupled Evervolt system. So DC coupled, coupling, connected, if you think about it like that, how is this connected? So we got DC coming in, we got solar from the array, uh, DC from the solar array coming in, connected to the batteries and we got the utility coming in. So it's got the DC source coming in here, the solar panels. And then if we've got our AC coupled system, this doesn't really care if you have solar panels or not. We all like it if it does, right? It's great if it does, but it doesn't need solar panels to operate. It just needs an AC source, AC coupled, right? So we could just put this on the wall, connect the utility to it, and use this as our own little backup system, right? And we can operate just like that, no problem. But if the utility grid goes down, we've got this much storage. And then once it gets low, we're kind of out, right? Yeah. So can I ask you for some numbers? Like, what's the input voltage for the black system? And what's the input voltage is here? And what's the watt hour capacity? Yep, it's great. So we'll get to watt hour capacity a little bit later. I'm trying to keep this pretty low level, sometimes I get really lost in the weeds talking numbers, and we can go deeper into the specs of the systems at the end of this, and then if people really don't want to fall asleep, they could just walk off and then we could still talk numbers. <laughs> um, but yeah, so usable capacity, just for a teaser, like we're at like 11.4 kilowatt hours, 13.5. But so I'll talk more about that in just a second for anybody else. Um, so anyways, we got our AC coupled system. So this doesn't need solar panels, but you know, we all like more solar panels, so it certainly can take solar panels, but it can't, you can't just plug a solar panel into this, right? Because the solar panel is going to be DC. This doesn't really want to see any DC. So what we can do is we could take those solar panels, put them through an inverter, and then invert it to AC, and then feed that into here, and feed the uh, utility grid, and then have that charge discharge the batteries. So that's what's referred to as an AC coupled system versus a DC coupled. Does that kind of make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and so I think I've got a suspicion that the color scheme is no mistake because our white Evervolt system matches up with our beautiful white power wall, which is also AC coupled, okay? And then our DC coupled, like Evervolt system goes with our DC coupled or our DC um, blue planet blue ion system and so uh, we will talk about that guy in a little bit and so anyway so we've got again the Tesla and the Evervolt here AC coupled it can operate with or without um, solar panels uh, it, but it's it's looking for that AC source interesting thing about here is here we've got our battery bank it looks, the inside of that looks sim exactly identical to this one. And we've got our inverter. What they've done at Tesla is they've got their batteries filling up this chunk here. And then they actually put an inverter up here. And they have a radiator in here also. You, I took the side panel open. People could take a look there later. It's pretty cool. It's got its own cooling system in it. Um, so anyways, so that, both of these can take, um, They've got their AC input and, you know, uh, they're going to, sometimes people call it an AC battery because, you know, it's a battery system and it's got, you know, you just plug AC in, AC out. But what happens is it's got a little inverter charger in there that goes down to DC because the batteries are still going to be DC, electrochemical fundamentals there. So with our lithium ion battery banks, you know, a bit different than the old lead acid battery banks we had. Um, What's going to happen here, you see we've got communication cable running through here. There's actually a Cat5 cable connecting each of these batteries together and going back and connecting to the inverter. So what happens with these is there's 351 cells in here. They look just a little bit bigger than a AA battery. 351 of them in there connected in a seri in, um, series and parallel configurations and broken down into little modules. And so each of them each of these little groups of cells in there is constantly monitored 
by our battery management system, our BMS, or B at battery management unit, same, same difference. And so what that's doing is it's constantly monitoring the cell voltages, the temperatures, and controlling the charge and discharge. So we've got a lot of smarts going on inside here, and that's going to help these lithium-ion batteries last a long time and operate safely and um, have a controlled state. Uh, state of charge and discharge and so that could be that's quite a bit different than we're used to with solar energy storage technologies with the old lead acid battery banks which was a big plate of lead plates with some sulfur with some battery acid in there and that um, we would just be able to charge and discharge that we could tell the voltage of it we could know what the external temperature was but there wasn't much control going on there right we were just controlling what goes in and what goes out now we're actually like controlling these uh, all these modules are communicating with each other and so um, so that's going to allow us to have varied usage uh, charge and discharge uh, patterns with them and with our Lithium ion battery banks, big, another big difference between them and lead acid is that they can discharge very low, right? A um, couple different lithium ion technologies, um, nickel metal cobalt and lithium iron phosphate. Um, that we can discharge 100%. We could take that battery down to 100% state of discharge and it's happy as can be. And it, you can bring it down, bring it back up. That's part of the whole cycle of it. With, when we have lead acid batteries, we generally don't want to discharge those below 50%, right? And then when we discharge our lead acid battery down to 50%, we want to get it up back to 100% as soon as possible so that it can stay charged and happy and healthy. And lead acid battery might even like being at like 101% state of charge, right? They always like being topped off. Our lithium batteries, they don't like necessarily being at 101%, you know, maybe like 95 is a real comfortable range for them. But then you discharge them and they can go down to 50%, they go down to 20% state of charge. They can hang out at 20% state of charge for days. It's not gonna adversely affect them like it would a lead acid battery. And so that's a, one of the big benefits of lithium ion systems that people see is just the functionality, right? You can, you don't, you can have it sit at a partial state of charge for a longer period of time. You think of people living off grid, especially in those colder, short winter days when you have your batteries discharging those lead acid batteries don't like sitting at 60 percent state of charge for days on end it's going to damage them pretty significantly you let a lithium ion system is going to ride through that a bit quite a bit better um, but again we've got our battery management system that's going to be um, monitoring that and not letting them discharge too deeply so there was a question about capacity earlier how much energy is in here so it's always a trick here because I'm, there's a lot of numbers and I can really get lost in the weeds throwing out all sorts of numbers. But um, if people can stay with me and if you get confused, we can always revisit it, you know, after this um, work, after this uh, tour. But so essentially what we have in these four, all four of these together is about 11 and a half kilowatt hours. So that's what you're used to being billed from the utility company with, right? That's the unit of energy, power over time, that they use for billing. And that's what we use for quantifying energy consumption. So, like, for instance, if we say we had our a standard refrigerator is going to draw about, oh, about one to two kilowatt hours per day, your standard refrigerator, that's the normal one in the kitchen that you use all the time, um, as long as it was built in the last 10 years. Your old beer fridge in the garage is going to draw closer to four or five kilowatt hours per day easily. <laughs> you get those really old ones with the, the rounded sides and the big handle, you're getting them like six kilowatt hours a day. So you're looking at half your <laughs> battery bank just for that beer fridge. So it's all about priorities, right? And so when we're designing our systems for um, battery backup for situations when there's no grid available, we want to quantify how much energy storage we have for um, the important loads. So we say, okay, if we got 12, what did I say? Uh, 14 and a half kilowatt hours in here. No, 11 and a half kilowatt hours in here. No matter what I said before, I meant 11 and a half. <laughs> um, with these four, we put two more in, we're gonna get up to 17.1 kilowatt hours. 
Um, so now, we, um, when we're sizing battery storage systems, we always start with the load. How much energy do we need, right? Okay, we do some math. If, I, if I'm backing up, I want my refrigerator. Okay, two kilowatt hours. I want my nice lighting in my house, uh, I mean, you know, in the kitchen. Uh, some of the important areas, maybe in the basement around the electrical panel or whatever your energy storage room is. Now we might be drawing, you know, another 500 watt hours, 0.5 kilowatt hours. We use those building blocks of consumption to figure out how long we can subsist with the amount of energy that's stored in these units, right? So anyway, so that being said, each of these energy storage systems are going to vary pretty significantly. Uh, so people are kind of, or not significantly, but vary enough. So everybody kind of get me where we're at with kilowatt hours, right? I think the fridge is always a good reference point. Okay, two kilowatt hours, that's what it's going to take to run the fridge. Um, you know, um, dehumidifier, that's going to take a lot to run. Um, lighting, not so much. So we do that math, we figure out how much energy we need, and then we can design our systems around it. So anyways, so this is expandable. We're at 11 and a half, we can go up to 17. The power wall here, this is 13 and a half kilowatt hours. Um, this is expandable. We're just going to get another unit and put it right in front of it, connect them in parallel, and then we've essentially doubled the capacity there. Um, then this unit here, this is uh, the Blue Ion HI. Um, so here we could see we've got four battery modules in the bottom. This literally just came in yesterday, or two days ago rather. And so we've got battery modules here at two kilowatt hours a piece. So we've got eight. We could get up to 16 kilowatt hours there. This is lithium iron phosphate. Um, and you know, there's basically like two, two or three primary uh, lithium ion chemistries. And that one is generally known as like maybe the less energy dense, but the more electrically stable, uh, the rock solid one. That's the one you can discharge to 100%. This you only discharge to like 85%, something like that. Um, but anyways, both very good technologies. They've just got Again, there's like, it's very hard for me to play favorites because there's just different features and functions of each different one that's going to make, you know, play into the decision making process. Um, but yeah, so you can see we're right in that range of 10 to 16 kilowatt hours storage per unit. And we can stack them to get more energy storage. Um, any questions so far? Um, so right now we're at eight kilowatt hours in there. We can go up to 16 kilowatt hours in that container. Eight, two kilowatt hour modules. These are 2.85 kilowatt hour modules in here. Usable capacity and um, room for more. And so again, like we, this is a sampling of the different residential type systems. And the plan is I'm still trying to get two more in here. I got room for two more. By fire code, we want to keep our batteries three feet apart. So works out nice. I put my non-combustible, my non, what would that be? Non-hazardous non in between. So I've got three feet here, three feet there. So I got room for two more. I'm like we'll be looking for, uh, you know, maybe a Generac system, Enphase, Solar Edge, just a couple of those um, that would be just wonderful. Cause then you get a real good uh, spec, uh, sampling of everything. What energy storage systems have you been putting in? Well, Generac mostly. Generac mostly. Power walls. Okay. Um, I haven't dealt with the Everhold yet. I was going to ask you. So, what's what's the max AC on the inverter there? Um, AC output or? Is that a 7600? This is uh, 50, uh, 6500. We could talk specs later. I don't want to lose. Okay, I'm trying to keep it real yeah, light, okay. fluffy. All right. We had uh, Mandela Barnes in here a few months ago. He was the first visitor to the Energy Source Tech Center as it stands. And um, I just went off into the weeds, all sorts of numbers, a poor guy. I wrote him later and I apologize. I said, I threw too many numbers at you. <laughs> I think I should have kept it a little lighter. He had a good humor about it, so it was good. <laughs> um, but yes. So what does the span buff? Perfect, okay, great segue. I was just gonna, looking for a reason to talk about this. So what is the span box? So looks pretty slick, right? And it's a breaker panel. That's what the span box is. Oh. It's, it's the smartest breaker panel you ever see. And so, I mean, just from an electrical and even energy efficiency nerd perspective, this thing is just amazing. But then you take into the, like the aesthetics of it, and you're like, man, it's almost like, like a you know Tesla designed a breaker panel or something, right? 
And so what happened was um, Arch Rao, who led development at Tesla on the Powerwall, left and started his own breaker panel company. And so uh, looking, when to approach, um, you know, one of the barriers to solar adoption, right? Like how do we do fast, effective um, energy storage integration, right? We've got a lot of power in here, a lot of power in here, a lot of power in the solar. How, if we design a breaker panel that can handle all that extra power input and effectively uh, dole out our energy usage, we can have an energy storage system that is maximized, right? We only have 11.4 kilowatt hours in here. And, you know, once we run out, we're out. And so what we want to do is make sure that we're using our energy as effectively as possible. And so what the span breaker panel does is it takes, you might look familiar, right? Just like your normal breakers, from, you can buy them off the shelf at any hardware store. And that's exactly what they are. They're just your normal, um, you know, five, $10 a piece breaker. And um, what they've done then is went behind the breaker and that's where they put the brains. So we're not looking at a $50, $100 circuit breaker here. We're just looking at a normal breaker that's got uh, CTs and relays behind there that's able to monitor and control every single breaker and show you that on your iPad or on your phone, on your app in real time. And so what we can do here is we can look into our uh, span um, app right here and we see, okay, we're drawing 65, 63 watts right now in real time. And so we take that off and give it a second and all of a sudden we're at zero watts. And so it knows what we're doing. And actually, uh, <laughs> we, this, this app will allow you to toggle these loads on and off. I was so excited to be able to shut off the loads for you all, shut off the lights from this app. Um, I had this installed like three days ago. And for some reason it keeps giving me this error something went wrong because probably something I did. <laughs> um, but anyways, it's gonna give us that um, visibility to see what each individual load is doing, but also give us the control of being able to shed loads if we need. And then it's gonna allow us to do this automatically also. So we can, we will set this breaker panel up. So um, it knows how much solar is coming in, how much battery is coming in, and how much capacity we have. And then what do we want to do in a backup situation? So if we lose grid power, we're going to be running off our batteries and we got to make every last kilowatt hour count, right? So it's going to allow us to break down all of our electrical loads in this panel into three tiers. Um, must have, nice to have, and not necessary. So if we lose grid power, it's going to say, oh, not necessary, you're shut off. Nice to have, we'll keep you on for a while. Must have, you're staying on, no worries. And it'll monitor that battery state of charge. And once we hit a set point, we're gonna be able to change that set point. But let's just say 80%. Once our batteries get down to only 80% state of charge, so they're still pretty full, um, we're, we're gonna, once it hits our predetermined set point, it's gonna say, okay, sorry, nice to have loads. You're going off. Kids' computer's off. Kids' PlayStation <laughs> is off. Stereo system's off. Um, but we still got our must-haves. We got our refrigeration, critical lighting, things like that. And then, um, but we can always override it too. We say, oh, well, you know, it's going to be sunny tomorrow. We just want to get through the night. So let's turn back on the TV or the surround sound or whatever. Let's waste a little energy, right? We got solar coming tomorrow. Um, and as we adjust these loads, we take them on and off it's going to tell us how long we are going to be able to survive just on our battery capacity. So it's going to say, hey, you've got one day, six hours left of battery capacity. So you're good. Keep going. Like, well, that's not as comfortable as I'd like. It doesn't look like it's going to be sunny for another day or two. So then you can adjust your usage and you say, okay, well, again, yep, sorry, kids, your PlayStation's going off, things like that. All, as you do that, your usable capacity is going to, or your duration is going to go up to say, okay, once you shut those off, now you're looking at two days worth of energy storage. All right, you want to tighten the belt a little more, you get up to two and a half days of energy storage. Um, 
yeah, so phenomenal stuff. You really, really great functionality here, and they're just at the tip of the iceberg of um, some really huge strides forward. And yep, uh, one last thought real quick. And so like the part about this is that it is really helps optimize your energy storage, right? If um, you think about phantom loads or you know empiric loads, like when you have your computer plugged in but it's not on, it's still drawing power, right? You do things like that. Um, just doing a little bit of quick math the other day, I said, okay, if I'm using up to 50 watts of power, right? My cell phone charger is going to use a couple watts. My computer charger is going to use about 10. My road, right? My, um, you know, modem is going to use some. I, you get up to like 50 watts use of, you know, phantom loads, something that's using energy when you're not expecting it to. If it's doing that for 24 hours, you've just lost 9% of the capacity of your whole battery bank just from wasting energy. And so um, that can be pretty significant, right? Especially, I mean, I think 50 watts is pretty modest for the amount of energy that's wasted in a house. But so now we can look at each individual breaker. We can see what's being used right now. The outlets right out there are using 220 watts. The lighting in here is using 65. Hall lights are 48. So we're gonna see real time what each load is using. So that's gonna help optimize our energy storage and make, uh, get the best out of it. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering how... I wish they, these panels were transparent. Yeah. You could see so much cool things going on there. You see all the little gnomes on the pulleys doing all the stuff that they're doing in there? And, uh, but we've got a hardwired ethernet. It's got a Wi-Fi connection and it'll just connect directly Wi-Fi to your uh, tablet. And then, um, but it also has options for cellular redundancy. Same with the power wall and um, same with the blue planet. Got the, you, you just got that redundancy built in. So that's pretty nice. I don't know if I talked about the versions in this one. No. Okay, great. So just like the, the breakneck speed of the progress of the rate of change here, like right now we're looking at this is version one. This, this inverter is on version one. This breaker panel is on version one here. This is version one. That's version two. So they've already revised that once, and that's on version two. So that's brand new. Um, so I bring this up because just to illustrate how fast things change and how compatibility is constantly being um, tweaked. So that's brand new uh, version two. I've been told they're working on version three. Um, I should never say that with my microphone on, but I don't know <laughs> what the deal is there. <laughs> But this is already outdated. They've got version two available right now. This is outdated. They've got version two that just showed up the other day that's in our back room. We're very excited about that. And this has got onto version two already also. So again, things are ch you know, changing uh, pretty consistently. So right now the span app or the span breaker panel will interact with the Tesla Powerwall and it will interact with the SolarEdge um, system. And right now, that's all that they have that I'm aware of. But they are working on diff, uh, interacting with other systems. With all of these, with the battery management unit, battery management system, smart load control, and grid uh, interaction, you can imagine there's a lot of communication going on, right? You want, if you have two different components from two different manufacturers, you want to make sure they communicate well, that they have a good handshake. And so that's why. Um, it's very selective, right? It, it takes time to get that built in, and I don't know whatever else happens behind the scenes, but there's only a couple units that this will communicate with. You can still, you can still backfeed this, but you can't have that smart control with the charge discharge of batteries. So right, right now, the Evervolt is just feeding into this. It's not manipulating the batteries at all because they don't talk together. I guess they aren't friends right now. I don't know if they used to be. I thought they were going to be, which is why I wired them up, but they aren't. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the one thing I didn't really hit on with this one is so I, we had the AC coupled, DC coupled, and this is, like, this is just a DC system. This is energy storage, the batteries, and battery management unit, but this doesn't have its own inverter. So this is pretty agnostic, right? It'll, go, it'll talk to many different multi-mode inverters. Any inverter that wants a 48 volt battery, um, in theory, should work with this. But then in, um, like in the communication world, there's a few battery inverters that 
this has been uh, tested to work with, they know they communicate very well. And so that's going to like lead to very seamless um, <laughs> operation. And again, they just actually upgraded their <laughs> energy management, actually their battery management unit and they, their new energy management system, which will be coming here soon. And that uh, I'm very excited about their Nakama energy management, where it's going to make this operate a lot like the span breaker panel where you're going to be able to see what each individual loads are doing toggle on and off and with all these units every single one of these you're going to be able to as long as the utility allows it you're going to be able to interact with the utility in more of like the smart grid manner you know uh, power control frequency control and that type of stuff so they have the brains built in and it's just a matter of having that um on off or, you know the the permission switch flipped yeah, um, so that's kind of the overview of what we've got here. Uh, again, we will have a couple more systems coming in soon. And we have our Solar Plus Storage, um, designing Solar Plus Storage System, Solar Plus Storage Fundamentals series that we'll be launching in August. And they'll be rolling out after that. We'll be doing those continuously. Good opportunities for people to come up here, get your hands on the different systems, twist nuts and bolts, or even just see the insides and the guts of all these. Um, so yeah, that'll be coming up. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions about that or anything we talked about today. And thanks so much for showing up. Uh, thanks for all your questions. Uh, this was a lot of fun. So have a great day. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Solar energy is fantastic and it's really neat to see how people are getting into the battery systems again now that we're using lithium batteries instead of lead acid batteries. So check with your local solar installer, uh, see if that's appropriate for you. Uh, or you could take, uh, for example, a class in renewable energy through an, organ an organization like the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. That's it for today and until next time, stay charged up. That's the one I installed right there. You installed it? Yeah, I installed that one. Right. So right in front of us, that's the one I installed. It clearly works as we got somebody charging their electric Kia up here.